In the last unit, we looked at completing SN1 and SN2 reactions of alcohols using halo acids such as HBr and HCl to enable the conversion of alcohols into alkyl halides. Those reactions can sometimes be problematic. For example, those reactions of, al of alcohols with HBr and HCl can give rise to carbocation rearrangements, for example. So if you started with a secondary alcohol and your desire was to create a secondary alkyl halide product, you might have a problem with that because the carbocation intermediate could undergo a carbocation rearrangement. So what do we do to avoid carbocation rearrangements and perhaps enable those reactions to go more smoothly with a higher yield? Well, one option is to use a couple of different reagents. One is phosphorus tribromide, PBr3, to enable us to convert alcohols into alkyl halides, specifically alkyl bromides, or alternatively, to convert alcohols into alkyl chlorides, use thionyl chloride, SOCl2. So the focus of this unit is going to be on looking at how we can use those two reagents to convert alcohols into alkyl halides as an alternative to reacting with HBr or HCl. So to highlight that challenge that we often have with secondary alcohols, we can see that if we take the secondary alcohol shown here, we react with HBr in an SN1 type reaction mechanism. What's going to happen is that once the carbocation forms, it's going to undergo a hydride shift so that the carbocation ends up moving to right here. And the nucleophile therefore ends up forming a bond there, the bromide anion is going to attack at that carbon, giving us a rearranged product. So what if instead we didn't want to create this product, but instead, rather than this product, we wanted to create a product that had the bromide come in here? Well, the way to go about doing that is to use phosphorus tribromide, PBr3. That is going to be a way that will enable us to convert primary alcohols and secondary alcohols into the corresponding alkyl halides without carbocation rearrangements. And we will take a look at the mechanism to see how we are able to go about accomplishing this. You'll notice here that if we use PBr3, phosphorus tribromide, what that is going to do is replace the carbon hydroxy group bond with a carbon bromine bond. Let's dig into the mechanism for that reaction using this particular example problem. So you'll notice here in the mechanism, I have gone ahead and included stereochemistry at the chiral center of this molecule so that we can keep track of what's happening during the course of the reaction. So first step of the mechanism, what I need to let you know about is that this phosphorus atom is going to be very, very positively polarized due to the fact that it's bonded to those three very electronegative bromine atoms. So that makes that phosphorus very electrophilic. It's going to be very eager to accept electrons. And so that's going to be the crux of what happens in the first step of this mechanism. The driving force and motivation is going to be that that very electrophilic phosphorus atom is going to come into contact with the electrons from the oxygen atom over here, which act as the nucleophile, to form a new bond to that phosphorus atom. Now at this point, to avoid going over the octet rule, for our phosphorus atom, what's going to happen is that the phosphorus bromine bond is going to break right here with bromine acting as the leaving group. This step is favorable because of the fact that when bromine leaves, it just gives Br minus anion, which bromide anion is certainly a very stable anion. It's a very good leaving group. And so not only is it a good leaving group from carbon, as we've seen before, it's also a good leaving group to break away from phosphorus. So let's go ahead then and write out the other intermediate that results from this step. And that's going to correspond to having a new bond between oxygen of our starting material and our phosphorus atom from PBr3. So we're going to make a bond between oxygen and phosphorus using one of the sets of lone pair electrons from our phosphorus. We'll have two bromine atoms still bonded to the phosphorus atom right here like so. So I'm just trying to dot all my I's and cross all my T's or in other words, count all my electrons and make sure that I've got everything going on correctly here. Now the phosphorus to start with had a set of lone pair electrons on the phosphorus itself. We didn't do anything with those. So those still need to be intact here. And the other thing that's still intact is the hydrogen atom that was directly bonded to the oxygen. So right here was our hydrogen and that oxygen also has a set of lone pair electrons. So we wanna make sure that lone pair set is here and the hydrogen is here. So I think we have everything in place now. 
Now that we have formed that new oxygen phosphorus bond, what we've done is created a really excellent leaving group. So as it turns out, this leaving group that I'm boxing off here in pink is outstanding. It's going to be a very stable product, making it a great leaving group. And so what's going to happen now, considering that we have a great leaving group bonded to this carbon, and this carbon will certainly be very electrophilic due to the fact that it's bonded to that electron withdrawing oxygen atom, what will happen is that that bromide anion that we released as a result of the first step of the mechanism is going to come in and do essentially a backside attack on our carbon atom that's electrophilic. So it's going to come in right here and attack at the same time the leaving group leaves. So you could think of this step as being very, very analogous to an SN2 type reaction step, except that our leaving group is that oxygen bonded to the PBr2, and our nucleophile is our bromide anion. So let's go ahead and write out the product of this reaction. So I've drawn out the HOPBr2 skeleton, and then I'm filling in the extra two electrons that that oxygen has picked up by breaking of the carbon oxygen bond is going to put an extra lone pair right there to give us that final product and we would have no formal charges on any of the atoms that's one reason why this is such a good leaving group because it's going to break away as a neutral molecule and then once that bromine has attacked our carbon atom there in an sn2 type reaction we're going to replace the carbon oxygen bond with the carbon bromine bond and we need to keep stereochemistry in mind here so we saw that up top here this was a wedge pointed toward us going to the oxygen. That bromine is going to be most favorable to attack from the back side of the molecule, the opposite side of where the leaving group is leaving, as is typical in an SN2 reaction. And so the bromine is going to be oriented away from us in the final product, showing that this reaction is stereoselective. And it's stereoselective, to put this into words, in that we have a backside attack. So the second part of this reaction, where we have the backside attack where the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon at the same time the leaving group leaves is very, very analogous to an SN2 type reaction. The first step is the step that is rather unique to this, where we have our oxygen atom acting as our nucleophile using its lone pair of electrons to come in and attack the very electrophilic phosphorus. So the electrophilic phosphorus is at the heart of why we're able to get this reaction mechanism started. And then the bromine coming in and doing a backside attack is how it continues. And due to the fact that this second phase here of the leaving group leaving at the same time the bromine attacks is why we don't have a carbocation rearrangement. This is also why this particular reaction of phosphorus tribromide reacting with an alcohol only works at primary and secondary carbons very well. It's rather ineffective at tertiary carbons because of the fact that this backside attack is sterically prohibited. It's sterically hindered, in other words, because of the fact that if we have a tertiary carbon here, there's just too much bulk around that carbon for the bromine to get in and attack. So I'll go ahead and write that down, that the reaction with phosphorus tribromide is generally pretty selective for primary and secondary alcohols. So the reaction is going to occur best at primary and secondary alcohols because at tertiary alcohols, we're going to end up having too much steric hindrance for that nucleophile to attack at the same time the leaving group leaves. Additionally, this fact that the nucleophilic bromide is attacking at the same time the leaving group is leaving accounts for why this reaction mechanism has no carbocation rearrangements taking place. And that's the real advantage here is that it will allow us to do this reaction without the risk of carbocation rearrangements taking place. We can also do this reaction with phosphorus trichloride as an alternative if our goal is to insert a chlorine atom into the molecule replacing the hydroxy group rather than a bromine. So an alternative to using phosphorus tribromide is to use phosphorus trichloride, PCl3, and that's going to react analogously in terms of the mechanism that is undergone here and the products that we would see and the advantages of the reaction. Another reaction type that you should be aware of that will also enable you to take a primary or secondary alcohol and convert it into an alkyl chloride is the reaction of a primary or secondary alcohol with thionyl chloride, SOCl2. So in this reaction, the thionyl chloride Thio refers to a sulfur, so thionyl chloride is SOCl2, 
And what that reagent is going to enable is the replacement of the hydroxy group from a primary or secondary alcohol with a chlorine atom without carbocation rearrangement taking place. So what we'll see here in our example is if we go ahead and start with a molecule that has our hydroxy group here, we treat it with thionyl chloride, SOCl2, we will be able to convert that hydroxy group into a chlorine without any rearrangement taking place, similar to what we were able to accomplish with the phosphorus tribromide, but there would be a different mechanism going on here. And I don't expect you to be master of this mechanism, but you should be able to predict what the product would be of this reaction if you're given any alcohol with thionyl chloride reactant. So to summarize what we've just looked at, if we're dealing with primary or secondary alcohols, those can be very challenging to convert into alkyl halides when we react with simply HCl or HBr due to the fact that those reactions tend to be slow and tedious and they tend to have carbocaline rearrangements. On the other hand, if we take a primary or secondary alcohol and react with either thionyl chloride, phosphorus tribromide, or phosphorus trichloride, those reactions are going to generally give the alkyl halide products from primary or secondary alcohol reactants in really good yields and without carbocaline rearrangements. So they have a lot of advantages for reacting with primary and secondary alcohols over using HCl or HBr.